Hey everyone, uh, I am, as they say, Mike Fletcher. Um, my little talk here is on how you can use mistakes to completely mess up your lives and figure out how to build better machine intelligences. Um, so my focus in machine intelligence is currently on how to produce an intuitive model of what the brain is doing so that it can guide how we build machine intelligences. I also am a practicing programmer and I screw up a lot. Um, I make an enormous amount of mistakes and my key in doing this is that I make big mistakes. I make those kinds of mistakes that really probably should kill me much of the time. Um, I make the kind of mistakes that produce stories. And our learning and our knowledge is often based on stories. It's based on the narrative that tells us how we are going to drive our lives going forward. And the kind of stories that I make often, or the kind of mistakes I make, are often predicated on a really stupid what if. So when I'm doing something and approaching something, I often say, what is the stupidest thing I could do? What is the obvious thing that is right and everyone knows that is right that I can challenge and say, I refuse to accept that. I refuse to accept that this is actually a limitation on what I'm going to do. So, for instance, when I started building the, Open G the scene graph in OpenGL, obviously Python is impossible as something to build it in. Um, when we started building the, the virtual reality product, obviously you would have to use Java. You would never use JavaScript for something like that. Um, when I first started, before I even knew what Python was, I decided to build a CMS in Prolog. Prolog, for those of you who don't know, is an entirely useless language. It's wonderful, but useless. Um, but as a result of this, as the result of digging those big holes, those problems that really were impossible. You were never going to get that bin prologue thing working. I learned an enormous amount, and it did eventually lead me to using Python and learning from people who would teach me because I was so obviously stuck in that hole. And I learned to love making mistakes. I learned to love the feeling where I had no idea what was going to happen where I had taken a flyer and I really didn't know what was going to happen the next moment. And I grew to love that feeling of skipping across the dunes of possibility and then dropping into a valley no one had ever been before and just kind of exploring and seeing if things still worked the same way they used to work. And the best thing about this is society basically accepts this. It even lionizes it. We tell our kids when, we're, when they're young, you should try to be a hero. You should try to start your own business, become whatever you want to be. We tell them this is, this is the way to be wonderful and amazing. And we tell them if they can just succeed, if they can just get out there and they can find some new truth and bring it back to society, we will, we will give them the chance to do presentations at PyCon and we will give them all the wonderful, amazing things that are gonna come. And we do kind of gloss over the part where they're probably gonna die. We do, and, but that's okay. You know what? We've actually built things into society where it's okay to take big risks. It's okay to start a company. It's okay to try things that otherwise would cause problems. So we have these mechanisms built into society that let people make those big mistakes. And the neat thing about this is almost everyone in this room probably loves making mistakes. Because after all, you came to hear me today for some reason, right? And the neat thing about this is it's not universal, right? Not everyone likes making mistakes a significant portion of the population are risk averse and they don't want to adopt technologies just randomly. They don't want to explore and find new, cor new corners. So let's try a silly what if. Let's try one of these stupid ideas. Let's imagine that the people who are like this are actually smarter than us. 
And those of us who like jumping across the dunes and exploring new worlds are actually the ones who need to open our minds. And to do this, we're going to try and reimagine machine learning with a conservative base where skipping across the dunes is an exceptional case. And most of the time, we're extremely conservative in how we think and how we approach. And to give you an idea of why, when you're in business, when you're in science, most of your customers are just going to want you to do exactly what they've asked you to do. They really don't want you to go skipping across the dunes, exploring new environments. They want a solution that works, that uses best practices, that does exactly what it's supposed to do. Uh, there's a wonderful piece of science where a professor in a university for 20 years killed off bacteria every night, froze a sample, killed off bacteria, froze a sample, killed off bacteria, froze a sample. And 20 years later, he discovered evolution. He was able to prove this, this strain of bacteria had evolved. This is smart stuff. This is stuff that wins. And this is stuff that actually works really well. So the thing is that it is smart. It works most of the time. It's the kind of thing that our customers want us to do. And we, the people who kind of jump around and think things should be cool and awesome all the time, we often have difficulty when our customers want to constrain us this way. We often see it as, as really hard to restrict ourselves from exploring these things. And agile development, which obviously most of us are probably practicing at this point, is essentially our customers and society saying, hey, you know what? Just do the hell what we told you to do. We want this. Do exactly that. Give, come back to me in two weeks, and I'm going to make sure that you're darn well doing exactly what I thought. So back to the crazy thought and back to our experiment. We're going to try and imagine how conservative thought will inform how we build artificial intelligences. So how do we currently build intelligence? One of the biggest problems we currently have in, in intelligence in artificial intelligence, rather, is how we get an intelligence to converge on a solution, to find a stable place where it can make predictions that actually make sense. Um, and so the way we do this currently is we take every possible input, as, as much data as we can get, and we randomly walk across the entire probability space. We say, hey, let's go way off in every single corner. And what we have is various methods that essentially try to use, uh, that try to use velocity. So we sample all across. We see if something works. And if something works, we take a little tiny step in that direction. And that use of randomness, that use of velocity, means that eventually we'll probably get to some spot that makes sense. But we try to sift the entire world down to that single spot, right? So we take everything that is possible, that could possibly be thought, and we try to find that little solution. And strangely enough, that is actually quite inefficient. When you try to, you try to parse the entire world every moment, it takes quite a bit of effort. Whereas humans, animals, we don't really do that. When we look at something, we are sampling all across the environment. This is a chimpanzee looking at faces. It looks at a corner. It sees that looks maybe like a mouth. Is there an eye there? Oh, yes, there's an eye there. Is there another eye there? Is there this there? Is there there? Ah, I think that's a face. I think that's a human. I think that's a lion, right? So we sample through the environment, and we make predictions. And those predictions are being tested to see, is this actually what we thought we were going to see at that spot? And within our minds, we have, we have what we would consider uh, a measure of certainty. And that measure of certainty is basically telling us, do we need to test again to see if this is more, like if, this is, if we need more data, or can we just accept that it's there? And these policies that we have inside us, which are called policy gradients in machine learning, these policies are learned. And the current hotness in machine learning is people doing what's called reinforcement learning. And what a reinforcement learning basically is, is it's saying, if I take 100 steps, I'm going to decay over time which step actually produced the proper value. Well, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, so 
and I can't apparently go backwards. So we will just carry forward. Um, so when we are doing when we are doing this uh, we're doing this analysis, we are moving. Uh, sorry, you know what? You actually need to be able to see that, and I can't do it. Sorry. Uh, oh, lovely. Okay, LibreOffice incidentally is not a great presentation tool, just in case anyone is looking for this. Um, so what we are trying to do is we're trying to, we're trying to look at the, the environment we have, we, we update what we think our model is, and then we, up, we check to see if that model works. Um, if we're satisfied, we go ahead. If we're not, we check more. And so that policy gradient that's, that's been learned over time, that's that difference between the conservative and the open mindset, right? We've made that analysis that says, most of the time, if I take a big jump, I'm gonna be happy. Or if I leave those things alone and just go along, I'll be fine. So what this allows us to do is it allows us to search not across the entire possibility of everything that could be done, but to just search in the things that we think are ambiguous. So what we do is we look through what we think could be happening right now and see which it is, see which thing is gonna match. So when, we are, when we're doing this, as far as, as far as we can tell, we're priming the neurons. We're priming the neurons one layer beneath to say, I think when you jump there, you're going to see this thing happen. And if you do, bump yourself up, make yourself more important. If you don't, go down. And the way we do it currently is we do a huge mathematical operation and we operate on it. So the end result is when we're perceiving, when we're, when we're looking at things, we're basically just guessing what's there. We check it. When we're done, we know what's happened. So the thing is that, that that guessing makes us incredibly efficient. It also makes us susceptible to what's called a confirmation bias. We're constantly projecting our beliefs into the world and testing if they're true. So when things don't match our, expert, our expectations, we can use our, we can modify the policies to say, you know what, this doesn't matter. It's, you know, I have something, I'm being presented with information that, that contradicts what I believe. I'll just blank it out. I'll just say, you know what? I, I don't need to know about that. Like that, that's okay. I'm, I'm still good. I'm, I'm going ahead. So we can actually ignore information and say that's not important. So I'm not going to assign any importance to it. I'm going to drop it out of my picture of what the importance is. And part of the, the learned policy is, do I need to update? Do I need to investigate? And eventually, you tend to get to a state where all the things I've had to, I've had to modify my model for, they become too uncomfortable. Like, uh, there's so many things that don't fit my model of the world, I've got to go explore, but this is scary. Because where I am right now works. I know I'm in a local minima. I know this, this little area, I'm, I'm able to cope here. But what's going to happen when I go somewhere else? And so we have degrees of belief that, that allow us to say, you know what, I can, I can tolerate a little bit of variance here, but I can't tolerate variance at the core beliefs that make me me, that make me understand myself. So when we're doing that parameter search, we're saying, for all intents and purposes, I am traveling down a ravine which, which is contained by my absolute unshakable beliefs. And these are things like objects exist. Human beings are, are a real thing. Um, there's, you know, there's, when I touch something, I'm going to get a feeling. And we've learned these things from far back. So the tools that we use in machine learning to do this kind of analysis are are basically uh, an approximation of how we do this, but they don't take into account the fact that we actually know some things. They try to make the whole thing converge at once where we don't do that. And over time, we've built up these ideas that are our bedrock. And 
we don't tend to challenge them. The further back in time you go, it tends to be the more bedrock, the more we've attached other ideas onto the idea that, that we've understood. And it seems as though some part of adapting to, to match actually gives us weight to the ideas that we've, we've given. So the end result is we're given to local minima. We're, we're given to being deep down in a rut, which is where we're, which is where we're working, where we're understanding everything I do is going to be within this milieu, within this understanding of what the world is about. And if there's nothing to get us out of that, we will simply stay there. So boredom and dissatisfaction with what's there, or if you want to think about it, thrill-seeking, that wonderful exuberance of I'm going to go and explore, is our brain's way of eliminating the local minima, of saying, instead of getting stuck in that little valley, I'm going to pop out of the valley, jump over to the next dune, and see what's in that valley next to me. So who's right in all this, right? Who's right about this? Should everyone go with the new seeker strategy? Should we only move if we're forced to? Or should we be conservative? And should we try to make things run nicely in where we are right now? Um, as a, as a, a wonderful little exercise, I, uh, I made up these stats, because it's always fun to make up your own stats. Um, they are actually based on something. But around 25% of the population will just say, you know what? I want to try something new. I want to go out and see what's out there. And 40%, eh, if you're forced, they'll do it. And in actual fact, that's entirely bunk. And it's a nice smooth curve. People learn these things. They learn these things. It's, it's a waiting we've done. And they're not the same in each field. We've experienced the joy of exploring computer programming, but we probably haven't experienced the joy of accounting yet. Or, or maybe you have. Um, so the only thing is that it, in a certain area, a new seeker has a lower threshold. And the conservative has a higher threshold. And deciding which one you want to go for, deciding how we're going to approach a given problem, is basically just a choice of, well, what do you think is going to be better for you? Now, I tend to come down on the new seeking side. I tend to, I tend to like jumping into new things. And a large part of that is because, you know, why not? Life really is awesome when you jump from place to place to place and explore. And it really is awesome building things that are totally stupid and have no purpose in existing. So obviously, I'm trying to trick you into jumping out and being killed so society can advance a little bit faster. That is obviously my goal here. I do want you to go out and do crazy things. I do want you to go out and do it. Because, you know, when you seize the day, when you do something awesome, you become the kind of person I want to have as a friend. You really do. But I also happen to have quite a few friends who are on the other side, who are quite, quite constrained in what they want to explore themselves. And there's a risk that we lock out the people who are constrained and, and who, want this, who want the little hobbit hole. They want, they want the quiet life. So above all, try to be excellent to each other and try to understand that these impulses are inside all of us. And if we use them, we can actually build a better model of how we work as human beings. And potentially, we can use them to build better machine intelligences. Thank you. So if, my t if I'm understanding correctly, the time should have been ridiculously longer than that, right? I, we're around 10 minutes? We've got 10 minutes for questions. Okay. Well, okay. So I would love to have 10 minutes worth of questions. I doubt we'll get that many because it was pretty self-explanatory. So, you know, sorry, if, if anyone has any questions, please go ahead. Anyone? Yeah. What's your current favorite AI, um, AI library in Python? Related, okay, but more um, pra pragmatic. A far more pragmatic question. Uh, at the moment, I use Keras. 
Uh, Keras is a library over Theano and uh, Theano and uh, TensorFlow. I assume you just came from the talk. Oh no, the talk over there. Okay. Yes. Oh yeah, I'll repeat the question. Sorry, I forgot to do that. All right. So um, you know, you talked about um, starting with uh, beliefs themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so so you said that you know in our present AI world, we usually start with uh, you know the random state and then try to converge. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you think of gradient descent, yes. Uh, initially, you take very large steps towards your goal. So. It's just one or two more iterations, right? And then you're already closer, much closer. The, the thing, what you're talking about is, sorry, uh, the question was, given gradient descent, which is one of the, the core mechanisms that we use, is, I would say it's probably the core mechanism we use for machine learning, um, isn't it just reasonable to use uh, uh, what's called velocity-based uh, velocity based convergence? Um, so the, the, the thing that I'm trying to show is that is not that gradient descent doesn't work. Gradient descent does work, and it is just a few more iterations. However, just a few more iterations at the scale of a human brain is actually a significant amount of processing power. Um, the, the thing about gradient descent as we currently implement it is that we're trying as I said, to, to parse the whole world simultaneously. And the efficiencies that should be available would allow, like, because we live for, you know, on average, 70 years. And long before you and I start thinking in terms of words and the like, we've, we've actually solidified ideas in our brains. Like, we don't have to relearn that objects are objects each time we look at something. Right? It, it, it's something that's just built inside. Like, we, we did that when we were kids, and um, there's a wonderful moment in, in childhood development where um, if you hold a ball and move it in front of a child, right, they, their eyes will track it, and they'll see there's a ball there. And then there's a moment in childhood development where if you hide the ball, they'll look for the ball. Right? And that, that, that transition is called object permanence. And they think, there is actually a ball, even though the ball is hidden. Now, that belief structure, that idea that's, that's, that's in our brains, that's a structure inside our brain somewhere, that idea can actually be learned by gradient descent. Right? Like, we can actually say, you know what? Look at all possible things, and it turns out that, you know, there's a, there's a ball there. What I'm... What I'm arguing here is that the efficiencies of having that already there, of having that from 40 years ago when I was a little kid and my parents were playing peekaboo with me, um, that efficiency allows the human brain to not require, uh, I forget what we calculated it last year, but it, it winds up being a, a truly, re like Google brain at the scale of a human uh, a human being would take probably a nuclear power plant to power it. And we don't need that kind of energy. We don't need anything like that kind of energy. A couple of neurons can fire and we can learn a new bit of information, right? So the, the, the difference there is that we have done the velocity optimization across years. And we've built all those big things, objects, realities, human beings, faces, all that stuff is already built into us. And we aren't challenging those all the time. So one of the big challenges you see with something like Google Brain with the, with the um, what's it called, with the reinforcement learning, is that you have to retrain Google Brain every time, right? Like when AlphaGo, when AlphaGo was, was running, it couldn't learn from the guy sitting across from him, uh, Lee Sedol. Sorry, I forgot his name for a second. Um, it couldn't learn from him. It could only learn from the things it had seen before it had, I believe it was about two weeks processing to integrate any new knowledge. So one bit of new knowledge requires completely reprocessing the entire, the entire matrix of what reality is. Whereas in our brains, 
because we're modifying models one level up and then projecting down, we can use a significantly greater efficiency in how we search the parameter space and how we, how we modify our models. We can, we can modify that model just by saying, well, you know, that didn't work. Reduce that, see if there's something nearby, if there's something similar to what I'm currently thinking that would actually match what I've got. And it doesn't even actually be, have to be that similar. It's just without violating all the other stuff, is there something I can see that would actually make this thing that I've now observed match? So I don't know if that actually addressed the question, but okay. Any other questions? Okay, so the, sorry, I, the, um, I was originally gonna give you just the peppy talk, okay? Because that was actually what I thought everyone wanted. And then I came to this conference and it was truly crazy that almost everyone I, I mentioned the topic of the talk to started giving the talk. That was kind of crazy. Because I would talk to people and they would be, oh yeah, you've got to be exploratory and you've got to go off and do this and everyone should do. And it was truly stunning to talk to people in a, in a group like this and just have every single one say, yeah, we should all be exploratory, we should all be going off, everyone needs to do this so that they can learn that, so that they can pull in these new ideas. And it was truly amazing to find out that my talk was entirely redundant for everyone in the room. It was, <laughs> I had honestly never internalized the fact that the people who tend to come to programming conferences and the people who tend to work in open source and do this are so, Large, by and large, so open-minded and so looking for new things to do that it, it was, as I say, largely redundant. Everyone had heard it all. And so that's why I actually got into the machine learning stuff so that I could actually, you know, have some new, top, new topics to tell you. So anyway, um, I think I've still got five minutes or so, right? Sorry, three? Oh, okay. Um, anyone else want to hear cool stories? Because, okay, so I don't know if anyone, anyone actually knows who I am. Uh, I've been using Python for forever. Yeah, a couple of you do. Um, I've been using Python since about uh, 95. And the neat thing is that that project I mentioned where I was trying to use Prolog to actually build a, a content management system to allow doctors all over the world to put their papers in and be reviewed and all that. And, and you know, of course, I chose the stupidest possible tools for it. That was actually, the reason I got into Python was I, I, I omitted a whole language in there. It was because I started to use Prolog and Prolog sucked. And I was like, oh, this, there's no way I can actually use Prolog to do this. The neat thing about Prolog is it's, a, it's an AI focused language and it just focuses on how to get facts matched up. It doesn't have any way to print. It doesn't have any way to do anything useful other than as, hey, maybe while you're in the middle of thinking about something, some text could go out the back end. So I switched over to using Perl. And Perl was one of those mind expanding things that I hated. One of those things where my mind just went, oh my God, I hate this with every fiber of my being, but everyone around me is telling me this is the best language in the world. And it was one of those moments where you realize, apparently, I'm wrong. I'm so totally wrong that the entire world is telling me I'm wrong. And at the end of that, I got to that point where I realized, you know what? I hate programming. Because I was a designer before I went, before I did this, right? I mean, I'm a, I'm a, a designer and a philosopher of design. That's, that's what I do. And I just realized, oh my God, I'm not cut out for programming. I'm so not cut out for programming because this is what programmers say is the best thing in the world. And uh, I got to the very last page of the book that I was reading through. And at, you know, I got to that point where I'm just like flipping pages idly going, oh, I don't want to learn this stuff. There's, there's 200 ways to do everything. And I just can't do this. And, and obviously I need to get out. So I got to the last page and the last page said, there's a new language. It just got him out. People are saying it's a better Perl than Perl. And that language was Python. 
And this was like Perl 1.2 or something, or I don't know what version it was. It was like some ridiculously ancient version. And it probably wasn't a better Perl than Perl at that point yet. Um, but I looked at it, and I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to download this in my 56K modem, and I'm going to try to make this content management system for, I'm going to try to do it in Python. And it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work at all. Um, I was 21 years old. I was taught to program when I was six. And when you're six years old, you don't really learn the fundamentals of computer science. You learn how to make things happen. You, make, you learn how to make pretty pictures, which is all you really care about. You make rabbits run around the screen. That's what you learn to do. And so I made some things run around the screen, basically, for the CMS, and it didn't do anything. It went nowhere. But I learned Python, and I got connected with people who would introduce new concepts to me. They'd introduce new things to me that I'd never even heard about before. Even though my father was a computer scientist, he didn't tell me about algorithms. He told me about how to use Epsidix on ancient IBM mainframes that I've never even seen physically. Um, but they gave me new ideas and new ways of opening up my brain that is what eventually got me addicted to kind of skimming across all the wonderful things in, in society. Anyway, I think we're, we're over time now-ish, so yeah. Anyway. Thank you.